Warning, some viewers may be too lame to enjoy the following information. The idea of flight has fascinated mankind for centuries. While humans have cool opposable thumbs that make using smartphones super easy, we lack the natural ability of birds or even fictional superheroes to fly from point A to point B. Instead, mankind has used their cool opposable thumbs to build machines to allow flight or even video games to simulate flight. Our attempts to fly didn't stop with airplanes and helicopters and actually extended into amusement parks. Roller coasters offer park guests the ability to climb to high heights, travel at fast speeds, and maneuver through crazy aerobatic elements, so why not do so in the flying position? And before we get started, I'd like to give a major shout out to my friend Sean who made this video possible. Sean is an expert on B&M flying roller coasters and provided much of the information for this video. Be sure to give him a follow on Instagram at Sean underscore pizza. If you happen to know a lot about a ride model and would like to see a problematic coasters video made for it, be sure to email me at eltororyansemail at gmail.com. The world's first flying roller coaster went by the name Skytrack, was manufactured by Skytrack International and opened in 1997 at Granada Studios in Manchester, England. Being a prototype attraction, the ride was plagued with issues and closed just a few months later. This was the only roller coaster built by Skytrack International and the company shut its doors shortly after. The second attempt at a flying roller coaster opened in 1998 as Comet at Encounter Zone in Dubai. This ride was an indoor attraction where riders would board into capsules and lay on their stomachs to simulate flight. The attraction was manufactured by Select Contracts, and just like Skytrack International, Comet was the only roller coaster the company ever produced before shutting its doors shortly after. Encounter Zone later shut down Comet in 2005. In 2000, the world saw the first ever successful flying roller coaster when Stealth opened at Paramount's Great America in Santa Clara, California. The $17 million attraction was built by Vacoma, an infamous and well-established roller coaster manufacturer. The ride model was officially known as the Flying Dutchman. Riders would sit four across in the six-car trains that held 24 passengers each. Guests would load into the trains while the vehicles were in an upright loading position. The trains featured a vest-like harness that would latch together like a seatbelt over riders' chests. Ride attendants would then come around and secure a lap bar, which featured bracing to keep riders' legs in place. When the ride was ready to dispatch, the train would lower into the lay-down position using hydraulics. Once the trains lowered, pins would extend and lock into place to ensure trains stayed in the laying position throughout the ride. Riders would leave the station and ascend up the 115-foot or 35-meter tall lift hill on their backs. After disengaging the lift hill, the track would rotate, flipping riders into the flying position while suspended over 100 feet or 30 meters in the air. The trains would then traverse the layout, which featured an overbank turn, a vertical loop, two corkscrews, and several elements where the track would flip riders from the flying position to the laydown position, or vice versa. Vacoma would go on to sell two more Flying Dutchmans in 2001, Batwing at Six Flags America and X-Flight at what was then known as Six Flags Worlds of Adventure in Ohio. These rides featured a few enhancements over stealth, like a dual loading station to increase rider capacity and an extended track layout. Rumor has it that Paramount Parks had originally purchased the 2001 Flying Dutchmans for King's Dominion in Virginia and King's Island in Ohio, but the company wasn't satisfied with stealth, which had a long list of issues, so Paramount simply sold the projects to Six Flags, and Six Flags installed the rides at parks nearby the original locations. Ironically, X-Flight would be relocated to King's Island in 2008, the park the ride was originally intended for and operated as Firehawk until the end of 2018. Stealth was also relocated to Carowinds in 2004 and went by the name Borga Simulator until 2007 when the ride was renamed Nighthawk. Batwing continues to operate at Six Flags America to this day. Now while the Vacoma Flying Dutchmans were certainly more successful than the original flying roller coaster Skytrack, they weren't perfect. The rides came with a lot of mechanical issues and a very complicated restraint system that made loading and unloading trains a very lengthy process. In 2002, the renowned roller coaster manufacturer Bolliger & Mabillard, or B&M, would introduce their flying roller coaster model, which to this day has remained the most technologically advanced flying roller coaster out there. Well, at least for now. B&M would open air, now known as Galactica, on March 3, 2002 at the Alton Towers theme park in Staffordshire, England. Similar to the Vacoma Flying Dutchman, Riders sat four across and boarded into the trains while in an upright position for loading. But at dispatch, instead of trains lowering into a laydown position, trains would be pulled upward into a true flying position. So riders would begin the ride in the flying position right away. B&M would also open a second flying roller coaster just a few weeks later on April 5th of 2002, Superman Ultimate Flight at Six Flags Over Georgia in Austell, Georgia. Unlike Alton Towers with its strict height restrictions on rides, Six Flags Over Georgia does not have that issue, so Superman was built larger than air. 
Superman also features the world's first pretzel loop on a flying roller coaster, which I like to describe as a super intense somersault. Both Superman and Air also utilize a dual loading station, which allows both rides to simultaneously load and unload two trains. The rides are both capable of running three trains, and each train has seven cars, which allows for good capacity on both rides. The use of B&M's world-famous box track design also lends to a very strong and rigid structure that delivers riders a fantastically smooth ride. In typical Six Flags fashion, the company ordered two more clones of Superman Ultimate Flight for the 2003 season, and these rides were installed at Six Flags Great Adventure in Jackson, New Jersey, and Six Flags Great America in Gurney, Illinois. These versions of the ride feature a single load station and only two train operations. So to make up for this, each train was extended from seven cars to eight cars long. This saves on the cost of building a second station, operating that second station which requires additional employees, and the cost of purchasing a third train. Being clones, the 2003 versions of Superman Ultimate Flight are not custom designed for their terrain. Both rides were placed over flat surfaces while the original Superman at Six Flags Over Georgia is actually a terrain coaster. To me, this makes the version at Over Georgia the best version of the ride as the train hugs the ground in many places that the 2003 clones just don't. The Over Georgia version also features a lower helix following the pretzel loop, and the two horseshoe turns that follow the pretzel loop appear to be lower and are taken at faster speeds than on the clones. I've heard a lot of rumors that the first Six Flags B&M flyer may have actually been intended for Six Flags Great Adventure for the 2002 season. The ride would have been installed partially on the plot of land that El Toro occupies now and fly over the small creek in between El Toro and Bizarro. The ride was presented to the Jackson Township Planning Board for approval, but was rejected due to the number of trees that would need to be taken down. If this is true, I'm actually quite happy the ride was rejected, as this led to the installation of El Toro that we have now. Now, I'm unsure if this B&M flyer would have been identical to the one installed at Six Flags Over Georgia, but either way, Great Adventure would instead get a clone of Superman Ultimate Flight for the 2003 season, in which the park installed on what was formerly part of the parking lot. Luckily, the park ripped up the asphalt and laid down grass to make the ride feel more natural. This is unlike the California Six Flags parks who infamously added two B&M floorless roller coasters on top of the parking lot and left the asphalt and parking lot lines present. These two rides would be Scream at Six Flags Magic Mountain and Medusa at Six Flags Discovery Kingdom. The Superman Ultimate Flight clone for Six Flags Great America was originally intended to replace Wizard, which is a vintage Schwarzkopf jumbo jet roller coaster which has operated at the park since 1976. Park guests had tested the idea of Superman replacing Wizard, so the park looked to move Superman elsewhere. They chose to dismantle Shockwave instead. Their large aerodynamics looping roller coaster which had operated at the park since 1988 then placed Superman there. And fun fact, there is actually a fourth clone of Superman Ultimate Flight which goes by the name Crystal Wing. The ride opened at Happy Valley in Beijing, China in 2006 and features way more theming than any other version of the ride. Now as I dig into the design and issues this ride model has, I will be focusing on the clone of Superman Ultimate Flight located at Six Flags Great Adventure, but this should apply to all versions of the ride. Being a new ride model from B&M, the B&M Flying Roller Coaster would feature many technological breakthroughs. The ride was actually one of the first coasters to feature an Allen Bradley touchscreen panel for the main operator at controls. In the past, whenever an error occurred, operators had only a trouble light to indicate this, or an audible alarm would sound to let operators know there was an issue, but the system did not alert ride operators of the exact issue. The issue was only reported on a small number screen in the main computer room, which is away from the ride station. Maintenance workers would have to look through a book to determine what error had occurred based on the number reported on the screen, but the new touchscreen on the ride actually reported the error directly in the ride station for the operators and what the error specifically was. The original B&M Flyers also featured a first-of-its-kind wireless communication system between the ride vehicles and control system. Signals would pass through the radio comm. Circled in red here is the radio comm. The radio comm consisted of several antennas that were used to wirelessly transmit signals. Say if the operator wished to lock the restraints on the train, they would push the lock button on the control panel. This command would pass through the Programmable Logic Computer, or PLC, to the ride's computer room. From the computer room, a wireless signal would be sent to the trains and then the train itself would lock its restraints. Basically the same thing as you using a remote control to change the channel on your TV. Now this could only occur when the train was parked in the station and power was supplied to the train. If the train was anywhere else in the circuit, this was not possible. The train would remain locked. Now besides that, the radio comm was truly different. This is completely unlike most roller coasters where a mechanical system independent of the ride vehicle physically connects to the train to lock or unlock restraints. So going back to TVs, this is like you telling your little brother to go change the channel for you, and your little brother would then go ahead and press the channel button on the TV itself. 
Here is the system used by most roller coasters built by Intim and Amusement Rides, where a copper rail connects to the train to send an electric pulse to lock or unlock restraints. But for the BNM flyers, the trains lock their own restraints via wireless signals without a physical interaction from the computer system at all. The radio comm also allowed for a train parked in the station to wirelessly alert the ride's computer if specific seats were unlocked, latched, locked, or which leg flaps were open. I'll discuss that terminology in just a bit. The ride's computer would then display this information on the touchscreen at main controls for the ride operator to see in real time. But being a new piece of technology for roller coasters, the radio comm also came with a lot of issues and was the biggest flaw on the ride's wireless control system. One issue is that the signal would not send any information or sometimes receive information. Or other times, the signal would send or receive the wrong information which could lead to train errors or downtime. I'll get a bit more into train errors shortly. Oftentimes, the ride would only run one train while maintenance workers took apart the other train as they attempted to figure out what was causing the communication issues. Over time, B&M solved this issue by installing a light comm, or basically photo eyes, on the front of each train. Once inside the station, the photo eye on the train communicates with another photo eye located on a pole which is outside the front of the station. While still wireless, this method was far superior to the radio method originally used and far decreased the amount of downtime the ride used to receive. The only time the ride loses communication nowadays is if a bird or some other object were to block the comm, which is a relatively rare occurrence, or if there is an overall computer error within the train itself or the computer room downstairs. Since then, all new B&M flying roller coasters now use a light comm instead of the original radio comm. In 2006, Tatsu at Six Flags Magic Mountain was the first B&M flyer to open right away with the light comm. Now as complicated as the wireless system is for B&M flying roller coasters, the trains are even more complicated. A lot of people will complain when Superman only runs one train, and I think this explanation will shed some light onto why that is. The ride vehicles for Superman Ultimate Flight are the most complex, most expensive, and heaviest coaster trains at Six Flags Great Adventure. From what I hear, each train costs well over 1 million US dollars. Each train is powered by a series of electrical brushes, which when coming in the station, ride along a rail that is on the load sides of rows 4 and 5. Row 6 also has a series of brushes, but all they do is clean the rail. The brushes on row 4 power rows 1 through 4, while the brushes on row 5 power 5 through 8. These are used to power the chassis pin motors, harness pin motors, proximity sensors, vest and leg flap hydraulic releases, the wireless comm, and the safety circuit. The safety circuit is a circuit of wiring in which a series of harness lock proximity sensors must be on low or high. If they are low on any harness or leg flap on the train, the train will not chassis up. Chassising up is when the train raises from the sit down position to the flying position while inside the station. Once chassied up, in order to dispatch, all eight chassis up proximity sensors must be high, and all eight pin locked proximity sensors must also be high. Each train features an absurd amount of wiring, approximately one mile of wire, or 1.6 kilometers. That is just shy of the entire track length of Nitro, a BNM hyper roller coaster that also operates at Six Flags Great Adventure. Along with that are 256 proximity sensors, or proxes, and even motors within the train. The proximity sensors are used to measure or locate different parts of the train. On just one row of the train, each harness has an unlocked prox, a harness latched prox, and harness locked prox. Each harness pin locks into holes which are called the left and right armrests. When you pull down your restraint, this is the clicking you hear as the pins lock into each hole. Alongside the other proxes, each armrest also has its own locked prox which is part of the harness safety circuit. Next, there is the leg flap minimum position prox. The leg flaps are what close around your ankles to keep your lower body secure throughout the ride. Now keep in mind, there are four seats per row, so there are four sets of all of those proxes I just mentioned. On the back of a row, the left and right side each have a chassis down prox, chassis up prox, a pin unlocked prox, and a pin locked prox. Moving on to the more mechanical side of the trains, as I mentioned before, the harnesses have a left and right pin that go into the armrests. Each pair is controlled by a small pin motor inside the yellow harness being pushed in or out. It can also be opened, latched, or locked by a manual release key in the event of an evacuation, or if simply the harness does not open automatically on its own. If the harness gets stuck, this is usually caused by an old or weak motor that soon needs replacing. Inside the mechanism are springs, so if by any chance the motor breaks, the springs will keep the pins locked, and the only way to keep them open is by maintenance taking the harness apart and fixing the broken part. But this occurrence is so rare that it's essentially just an extra safety device, which makes B&M so safe. 
In the event that a harness needs to be taken out of service, a bar goes across the seat, and since the harness is controlled by a computer instead of mechanically, a bypass plug must be installed so that the computer knows a specific seat is out of service. When in a bypass state, the seat will not function with the rest of the train when unlocking, latching, or locking. When your yellow harness is unlocked, you can push and pull it up freely. It doesn't lock into any of the holes in the armrests. When the harness is latched, this is when you can pull the harness downward, but it doesn't go up. So this is when you can pull down your own restraint, and it clicks into the holes. When the harness is locked, this means that the harness is now locked in place, so it can't go up or down. This is what happens before the train dispatches. Even if the harness has a faulty proximity switch and will not verify as locked, with the bypass plug in the seat, it will verify in the panel and the safety circuit and the train will be able to be dispatched. If there is a faulty leg flap, the seat will be bypassed in the exact same way with the bar and the plug. The next part of the harness system is the vests. More common on modern roller coasters of today, but revolutionary at the time. The vest is part of the restraint that molds to your body when pulled down and is controlled by hydraulics. When the train has power and is unlocked or latched, the vest can move freely. Once the train is locked or has no power, it can no longer move. It is fixed on the rider's body. In the event the train loses power or needs to be unloaded, a switch can be found on the back of the rows for each harness, where the vest, once pressed, can move freely. This can only be done if the train is chassis down, which can be achieved on any location on the brake run. It can also be used in the station if the train is chassis down. But if the train is on the lift hill, or in the station but parked in the flying position, it cannot be used because it cannot be accessed. When pulling the harness down and flying, it makes a loud screeching noise, but it is perfectly safe and designed to be open like this by B&M. Now in order for the vest to be open manually, the leg flaps must be opened first. The leg flaps are what hold your feet in during the ride, so that they quite literally don't get chopped off. They secure your feet in a fixed position for the duration of the ride. When operating a B&M flyer, the leg flaps are something that should not be missed. At Six Flags Great Adventure, if a leg flap is missed, it looks very bad upon the attendant who did this and also the ride supervisor. If it is noticed that a leg flap is not secure when the train is dispatching, the ride operators will immediately let go of the ride dispatch buttons. But if it is too late and the train proceeds to leave the station, the ride operators will press the lift stop and stop the train at the bottom of the lift hill once the train has fully engaged the chain lift. From there, the ride attendants will go and fix the issue by securing the leg flap. The leg flaps are pretty cool. They open automatically when the train chassis down after entering the station. If the vest restraints are unlocked and you pull that harness down, the leg flaps will close, then reopen once the harness is down. The reason for this is that the hydraulics have not been told to keep it closed, so they open back up. But once the train is latched or locked, they will close and stay closed once the harness is down. But B&M have accounted for the leg flaps still open, hence why you'll see attendants kicking them closed. Even if they are already closed, the attendants are required to kick them still to ensure that they are downward in the most minimal position. The flaps can only be opened manually by a switch which is underneath the train in the event of an unload, or if a guest's feet are outside of the closed leg flaps and need to be brought back inside. On the armrest that the harness pins click into, there is also a third safety pin that comes out when the train chassis up. This is essentially a last resort. For if some reason the harness pins fail, which is extremely unlikely as said before with the springs. In the event of an evacuation while the train is still in the flying position, these safety pins must be pushed in manually by using a gum scraper for the harness to fully open. Each row also has a pair of chassis pins controlled by a motor that when the train chassis up, extract out, locking the chassis in the flying position. And when the train returns to the station, the chassis pins are tracked so that the chassis can chassis down. These can also be cranked manually in the event of an unload with the crank. They are spun clockwise to lock or counterclockwise to unlock. So if you couldn't tell already, Superman's trains feature a lot of electronics. The trains already operate wirelessly, and the added electrical wiring, sensors, pin motors, and restraint systems make these trains so complex. So complex that they are subject to train errors. Most roller coasters are subject to computer, mechanical, or electrical issues, where the ride must shut down due to an error or faulty ride component that needs to be replaced. Well, because Superman's trains possess so many components, the trains can have their own errors which are completely independent of the ride. With a normal roller coaster, if there is an error with the motor that powers the lift hill, the entire ride is forced to shut down. But if Superman has a train error, only that specific train is affected as the error is contained within that train, and the other train and the entire ride itself may continue to operate. Now train errors can only occur when a train is parked in the station and is connected to power and the wireless comm. 
In most cases, the error can be easily reset and the train can continue to be used without any issues. But since Superman is still subject to normal ride errors like other roller coasters, this contributes to the downtime a B&M flyer can experience since there are now two major sources for downtime, both ride errors and train errors. It is actually possible for the ride to experience both a ride error and a train error at the same time since the errors come from two independent systems. If a train error can't be resolved, the train will have to be removed from the track so that maintenance workers can address the issue. And since the trains have so many electronics on board, this is quite a common occurrence. Compared to the trains on a B&M flying roller coaster, most other roller coaster trains are simple as dirt. So for other roller coaster trains, there are so many less possible issues that a train can have which require the train to be taken out of service. Another reason for one train operations on Superman is weather, specifically rainy weather. While the trains are water resistant, the train should not operate in moderate to severe rain due to all the electronics on board. In most cases, the ride runs both trains unless park attendance for the day is low or the other train is in need of maintenance. If rainy weather is in the forecast but later in the day, the ride will begin the day operating two trains. But as the storm approaches, maintenance will come to the ride and remove a train and reduce the ride to one train operations. The second train will be parked in the storage shed. This eliminates the chance of the second train stacking on the brake run while operators load the train in the station, as when the train stacks, it is exposed to rain and water can pool on top of the electronics. The ride will continue to operate with one train as the storm approaches. Depending on how bad the storm is, the ride can continue to operate through the rainy weather, or if the rain is too heavy, the ride will be forced to stop operations to protect the electronics on board the train. But when the train is parked in the station, row 8 of the train actually hangs outside the station building, so if the rain is too heavy, water can pool on row 8. And also, since the station building is open air and not enclosed, rain can get inside the station and soak the train still. When these things happen, the ride supervisor will have the train removed from the track and placed in the storage area as well to protect the electronics. So when you see a B&M flying roller coaster running less than the maximum train count, it is usually due to train errors, general maintenance, or approaching inclement weather, or just the park being really cheap. Also another fun fact about the trains, the upstop wheels which ride underneath the rails are the exact same size as the road wheels which are the main wheels that ride above the rails. On most roller coasters the upstop wheels are much smaller than the road wheels as they don't need to account for as much force as the road wheels do. But because of the pretzel loop, the upstop wheels had to be the same size as the road wheels to account for the forces exerted there. Now let's talk about the mechanism that raises Superman's trains from the loading position to the flying position. This is done using a Hirsch Arm, or SAM, which stands for Swinging Arm Mechanism. On each row of Superman's trains are wheels that ride along the left and right edges. These wheels are called the Hirsch Wheels. Inside the station, the Hirsch Wheels ride within the Hirsch Rails. There are two Hirsch Rails, located on the load side and unload side of the train. The Hirsch Rails are connected to the Hirsch Arms, which together raise and lower the train. The Hirsch Rails are actually flexible and separated between each row. This allows the system to account for the different weights of each row when guests are on board. There are also bell weights at the top to help the Hirsch motor with the weight of the train. Think of this as a counterweight system. Below the bell weights are springs which help to absorb forces while the trains lock their chassis pins when raising into the flying position. The springs allow the system to have some give to it, which allows it to absorb these forces. Now the process of raising or lowering the Hirsch system takes 80,000 lines of computer code. Yes, 80,000. During the process of chassising up or chassising down, the system knows when to move the Hirsch arms faster or slower based on the code itself. There are two encoders that make execution of the 80,000 lines of computer code possible, and it is actually possible for one encoder to run faster than the other. When this happens, the system will flag a ride error which will stop the Hirsch system from moving. The encoders can also stop responding, which can cause ride errors as well. These are usually just computer glitches that can be easily reset. The Hirsch arm has three positions. Position 1 is flying, which is used when trains are advancing or dispatching into the station. In this position, the Hirsch wheels are not touching the Hirsch rails. The second position is called unlocking slash locking flying. This is the position where the Hirsch arms will lift the train slightly while in the flying position to take pressure off the chassis pins while they retract in or out to lock the train in the flying position or unlock it from the flying position. The last position is the loading slash unloading position where the chassis is lowered to a sit down position. Let's watch this in motion. First the Hirsch starts in the loading slash unloading position. Then it pulls the train up into the locking slash unlocking flying position. The chassis pins on the trains will lock into place, and then the Hirsch will move again so that the Hirsch wheels are not riding against the Hirsch rails when the train leaves the station. On each side of the Hirsch are a set of photo eyes, and each photo eye is installed at the ends of the Hirsch. Along each Hirsch arm are holes. A light beam passes from the photo eye at one end of the Hirsch to the photo eye on the other end, and must pass through all the holes along the way. 
The Hirsch can only move as long as the light beam remains unbroken. If the light beam is broken, the Hirsch will stop in place. This would indicate that the Hirsch arms are not in sync with each other. But that is a very rare occurrence, and it's actually more common for the light beam to be broken by a bird flying through the sensors. When the train enters the station, there are proximity sensors on either side of the Hirsch rail that count the Hirsch wheels on the train. Each side must count 8 wheels in order to start the chassis down sequence. But if they don't count all 8 wheels, once the train parks in the station, it'll cause a ride error and maintenance will have to come and reset it. In typical problematic coasters fashion, let's dig into the block zones found on Superman Ultimate Flight. For anyone who is unfamiliar, a block zone is a section of ride that only one train may occupy. At the end of a block zone is a method to stop the train in case the block zone ahead is occupied. This is the safety system that keeps roller coaster trains from colliding with one another. Superman Ultimate Flight operates with four block zones. The block zones are as follows. The Station, Lift Hill, Service Slash Safety Brake, and Transfer Track. The transfer track is the section of brake run immediately before the station that can change positions to allow trains to enter or exit the storage shed. There is a section of brake run directly behind the transfer track called the safety brake run. While this brake run consists of friction brakes that are capable of stopping the train, the safety brake run is programmed into the same block zone as the service brakes, which is the brake run immediately following the inline twist. So if a train is stacked in the transfer track and another train is approaching the final brake run, it will stop in the service brake run, which is immediately after the inline twist, even if another brake run exists before the transfer track. As a result, the safety brake more so acts as a trim to slow down trains before the transfer track. This is very common with B&M roller coasters. The manufacturer seems to prefer placing an extra brake zone between a train coming to a full stop and the next train stacked on the brake run as a safety precaution. Now the safety brake run will stop a train if the ride is e-stopped. Unlike the uphill safety brakes on Big Thunder Mountain at Disney World, which I covered in my previous video. Now the service and safety brake runs can slow trains to different speeds. The ride uses an axle count, similar to the one in the station, to determine how much a train should be slowed down. The axle count literally counts each wheel bogey as it flies past the sensor and counts to 8 to count all 8 bogeys. This allows the computer to tell how fast trains are moving. As its name implies, the axle count counts all the axles, or wheel bogeys, as they fly past the sensor. This allows the computer to tell how fast trains are moving. The computer will respond by pulsing the brakes open and closed, until the train has reached the desired speed. This leads to the famous B&M pulsing sound as the train hits the brake run. Now let's talk a bit about the lift hill. If a train on Superman Ultimate Flight is dispatched too early, it can stop at the top of the lift hill since the other train is still leaving the safety brake. This is what the ride crew likes to call a super roll. The crew strives to achieve this, but Superman's trains feature the hardest restraints to check in the park, which makes this very difficult. In order to super roll, operators need to dispatch the next train when the train on the course is about to begin the upward helix into the inline twist. Because the service brake and safety brake are programmed together as a block zone, the train on the course must be fully on the transfer track before the next train can clear the lift hill. This will cause the train on the lift hill to slow down and then eventually stop at the top of the lift as it waits for the train ahead to clear the safety brake. The approach to the lift hill consists of a section of tire drives called the feeders. As their name implies, these tire drives feed the train into the lift hill at a constant speed until the train has fully engaged the chain lift. This is quite common on any roller coaster built by B&M. Superman features a lift motor that can run at 3 speeds instead of the typical 2 speeds found on most coasters. Most roller coasters have an idle speed and run speed. Idle is the slower speed the lift motor runs at when there's no train on the lift hill. As a result, the lift motor uses less energy, which saves money. Run is the faster speed the lift motor runs at when pulling a train up the lift hill. Superman has both idle and run, and also an engage speed for the lift hill. Since the trains are so heavy, the engage speed is slightly slower than the run speed. Once the train has fully engaged the lift chain, the speed increases from engage to run to quickly pull trains up the lift hill. At the top of Superman's lift hill is another axle count which is used to determine if the lift hill block zone has cleared. As the train passes the axle count, the axle counter must count all 8 wheel bogies before it can determine the lift zone is clear. Once the lift zone clears, the lift motor is told to reduce from run speed to idle speed. If the axle count does not count all 8 wheel bogies, a ride error will prompt and the computer will create a ghost train. Ghost trains are computer glitches where the ride actually thinks a third train is on the track instead of two. This will cause the train running the course to either stop in place on the lift hill or at the next control point like the service brake run. Referring back to the block zones, the original Superman Ultimate Flight at Six Flags Over Georgia appears to feature a different brake run design. On the 2003 clones, the service and safety brakes are on two different sections of brake run, as I depicted earlier. 
The service brake is immediately after the inline twist, and the safety brake is before the transfer track. While the original version of the ride features a longer brake run after the inline twist, I believe this section houses both the service and safety brake runs and acts as one block zone. Then following the right turn off the brake run, the transfer track starts right away. The 2003 clones were most likely modified because they do not have the dual loading station, which meant that the setup could be changed. Let's discuss the capacity of the ride. At Six Flags Great Adventure and Six Flags Great America, Superman Ultimate Flight is capable of 43 cycles per hour. With 32 passenger trains, this means the ride is capable of 1,376 riders per hour. In order to achieve this, a train must be dispatched about every 84 seconds. For some roller coasters, the theoretical capacity is achievable, but with Superman's complicated trains and restraints, this makes it much harder to hit the theoretical capacity. That's why it's pretty common for a B&M flyer to stack trains, even if the ride crews are working hard and diligently. On most roller coasters, the train simply parks in the station and unlocks the restraints to allow for the next loading cycle. Superman's trains must first park and then chassis down to the sit-down position. Then the movable floor underneath the train must raise into position. Only then can the train unlock its restraints and begin the next loading sequence. And when the train is ready to be dispatched, more time is wasted for the movable floor to move out of the way and for the train to chassis back up into the flying position. The only thing to speed along dispatches for a B&M flyer are large ride crews, which Six Flags unfortunately do not like to provide to save costs. Attendants must check all harnesses and also kick the leg flaps, which means they cannot speed down the train like on a B&M hyper roller coaster. At Six Flags Great Adventure, the crew aims to achieve 734 riders per hour, or roughly 23 trains per hour, when only two attendants are checking restraints, and with four attendants, 960 riders per hour, or 30 dispatches per hour. To hit the theoretical capacity, the ride truly needs a very large ride crew, maybe six attendants checking restraints, and the dual loading capability found on Superman at Six Flags Over Georgia. Otherwise, you have to literally run as you check the restraints. Thankfully, most B&M flyers have been built with the dual loading station, which gives parks the opportunity to speed along operations. Whether they choose to use their purchase afterwards or not is up to them. The movable floors have also been replaced with fixed floors that feature wedge platforms. The lack of a movable floor helps to save on dispatch times, since trains don't have to wait for the floor to drop or raise. And I have just one more fun fact for any of the people who have watched this entire video, congratulations. On the transfer track before the station is a Hirsch arm check. It's on the right side of the track, and looks like a little bar that hangs down over the right side of the train. The point of this arm is to check to make sure all rows of the train are still chassis up or in the flying position. This is because the train must re-enter the station while still in the flying position, as the Hirsch system in the station is adjusted to accept the train only in the flying position. If a train were to somehow roll into the station while in the sit-down position used for loading, it would damage the Hirsch system in the station. So if a Hirsch wheel on the train were to run into the Hirsch arm check, a proximity sensor on the arm will alert the computer and the ride will automatically e-stop to prevent any possible damage. However, the Hirsch arm check has actually never been needed as the train has never rolled through the transfer track while in the sit-down position. It's just another added safety precaution added by B&M. Although Superman Ultimate Flight isn't the most thrilling roller coaster on the planet, the way it works is pretty mind-boggling. The trains on the ride are probably some of the most complex roller coaster trains in the world. In my next video, I will be giving a full review of Flying Dinosaur at Universal Studios in Japan, which happens to be the most intense flying roller coaster I've ever ridden. So that will conclude this episode of Problematic Roller Coasters. I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something new. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you get notified the next time I upload a video. Be sure to check out the El Toro Ryan merch store located on Amazon to help support the channel. Thank you for watching, everyone. Peace.